Welcome to the Femininja Project. I am your host, Cheryl I Love, middle-aged ninja hiding in plain sight, dedicated to restoring human dignity one person at a time and helping you unleash your personal power. Discover that it's possible to look like a woman, act like a lady, move like a ninja, and think like a warrior. And remember, men are always welcome on the Femininja Project. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Femininja Project and thank you so much for tuning in. And you know, life is full of hits and how we handle those hits and those life challenges are really important. And we have a very wonderful guest today, very inspirational. Her name is Michaela Cox and she knows a lot about overcoming obstacles. She is a multi-published author who writes about motherhood, faith and culture. Michaela knows what it's like to face life's challenges and tribulations through her own journey of lifelong disability of legal blindness, divorce at 26, and the death of a beloved husband at 38, throwing her into the role of solo parenting while grieving the loss of her husband. Through her books and her heartfelt meditations, Michaela empowers people to overcome their own life trials and tribulations and thrive in every circumstance. Michaela, thank you so much for being here and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate you being here and you are a prolific author. Uh, thank you. <laughs> you have written multiple books and uh, I want you to, we're going to touch on that a little bit later, but first I'd really like for you to share with the audience, you know, how you came from or some of the trials that you went through just your whole life's journey to where you are now as being a very successful author and writer. Well, I um, it started from the very beginning. I call it my 38 triple D. It has Nothing to do with physical appearance, or my <laughs> not what people think. Maybe when I was pregnant, but no. Um, it's called that because I've spent, a, a, I've traveled a journey of going from much tribulation to thriving in all things, which includes a lifelong disability of legal blindness that started from birth. Yeah. And then the second D is divorce at 26. And the third one is, like you said, uh, the death of my second husband um, back in 2017. Mm. Uh, the disability has been from birth. I've never had a day or I've taken a breath or will I have a day or take a breath where I'm not viewing the world through eyes that are totally jacked up. <laughs> oh. screwed up. Um, I'm not sure of your audience's background, but for mine, I'm faith-based. And so um, I was actually born totally blind. Oh. And then at seven months old, our family believes that there was a miracle done in my life because I did gain my sight, although mm -hmm. it's impaired. And so, um, but I have had it my whole entire life. So mm -hmm. make things kind of interesting. I'm sure it did, especially when it comes to parenting, but, um, you know, and, and the faith-based is very important. That's a very important part of your life. And you actually do write a lot about faith and you have a lot of faith-based books. Correct. So faith, again, is a very important part of your life's journey. And I think for a lot of people, the ones who really are able to overcome a lot of life's challenges, faith is an important part of being able to carry through some of the things that we think that we just can't recover from. Right. I always say uh, my faith first and foremost. I mean, I won't say otherwise. Um, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for that. I mean, and I wouldn't be having these conversations that I've been having lately. So, mm -hmm. so then that was your first trial and tribulation, just being born with that disability of legal blindness. And I think it's just fascinating that you were totally blind at birth, but then at seven months, you were able to regain some form of sight. Correct. Yes. And uh, then your next big D um, came with divorce at the age of 26. Yeah. So um, tell us about that. I did like most people do, you, you know, you go to college, you meet someone and y'all decide to get married and it ended up being a crap show and not worked out the way you thought it would. I mean, no one goes to the altar of the rundown, you know, walk down the aisle thinking, oh, yay, we're going to get married and get divorced. No, no one does that. Yeah. So, um, or you wouldn't get married in the first place. Um. And it's just not how it was um, 
thought it was going to be. And so I decided I had to walk away from that. And I did. Oh, wow. That takes a lot of courage. Yeah. Especially in my family, because none of us really got divorced in our family. I mean, I'm not saying that society, that's nothing wrong. That I'm just saying from my personal background, we right. never really did divorce until my generation. Like there's only two of the granddaughters that are divorced <laughs> and my parents wow. have been married for 47 years and another set of my mom's brother and wife have been married. I don't know how long, probably since the eighties. And, you know, my mom's parents were married for almost 30 years when he passed away. So and my mom's grandmother has been a widow her my whole entire life, but so we just, that's just not what you did in our family <laughs> till my generation. So it was well, kind of challenging. Well, yeah, it's hard to go against the tribe. Yeah. I mean, no one, no one faulted me for it. They didn't like treat right. me poorly for it, but it's just when you've been raised to believe a certain way, it kind of rocks when something like that comes along, it kind of challenges your core, you know? <laughs> yeah. Rocks your boat. So you get divorced and at that point you still don't have any children. No, I didn't have my kids until my second marriage. So how long were you single before you met your second husband? I met him in 05, not long after being divorced, which sounds really, depending on your interpretation of events, meaning in general, really horrible. But I had been on my own for almost a year and had already been through counseling and like a divorce support group before I decided to date. So even though it had only been legally three months, it had really been more like a year. So. Well, we don't judge. That's one thing yeah. we don't do on, on the Feminine Ninja Project. There's absolutely no judgment. And sometimes, you know, uh, when circumstances, you know, just change, they change. And when an opportunity arises, it does. Exactly. And everything at its own timing, you know, you can't force something and you can't sit yeah. back and deny it. So good for you for doing it. And um, we dated about two years and then we got married in 07. And then we were married for almost 10 years. Mm -hmm. Wow. And your kids are, how old are they? Now they're eight and 11, but at the time of their father's death in 2017, they were six and three. Oh my goodness. Not the youngest I've ever heard of, but definitely not the oldest either. So yeah. How traumatic for all of you. Yeah. It was, and it was sudden and it was unexpected as well. So. Oh my goodness. Wow. I'm so sorry to hear that. Thank you. So now there you are. I mean, that's probably, yeah, the three D's and the age of 38. So you're 38 triple D. Um, yeah. And that's a biggie. Again, now there you are all of a sudden just thrust into this role of solo parenting of two very young children who probably don't even fully understand, you know, where their dad is or what happened. I think my daughter did a little bit better than my son did, but there's three age difference between them. So, you know, mm -hmm. where they were at cognitively speaking allowed for more versus not, I think at that time. So, and how did you either explain it to them or how did you make that shift of going from here? You are in a, a loving marriage and relationship. And now all of a sudden your husband is gone and there you are trying to, you know, be mom and dad at the same time you have to do, it's an incredible adjustment. I, I can't even yeah. imagine what it's like. People tell me I'm doing a good job, which maybe I am, maybe I'm not. I don't know. It depends on what day it is. And I always just always say, you know what? Ask me that in 10 years and they're 18 and 21 and out of the house and have a job paying the bills, not on, you know, some national syndicated TV show airing their dirty laundry or you know, strung out on God knows what. Then we'll have that conversation in 10 years. No, I'm kidding. But um, <laughs> so I'm still in it. But um, yeah, it was because. Um, I mean, he had went to, um, at the time I was done with grad school at that, but he was still in school online and he went to go do homework and he said, I'll see you tonight. And he didn't come home. Oh, I had a knock. We were living on the East coast at the time, uh, in New Hampshire. And, um, I had a knock on my door, uh, East coast time at nine o'clock, uh, saying, Miss Cox, we need to speak with you about your husband. <gasps> oh. And you yeah. were by, by yourself when you got the news? Well, my kids were asleep in bed and thank well, God they stayed asleep during it. But yeah, I was at home by myself. No other, you know, 18 and above in the house. It was me and the two kids that were asleep. <laughs> Did you have family nearby at the time? No, we lived 26 hours away from all friends and family for the most part. Oh my God. I mean, we have friends in New Hampshire, but all our, most of our family was down South. So what did you do? Um... And what was your first reaction of, 
what do I do now? I just got this news. And, you know, did you think, who do I call? Or did you just kind of sit there in shock and, and wait for inspiration of like, you know, there is something. no inspiration in that. <laughs> yeah. I think diversity was, but well, there is no inspiration. It's called autopilot and shock and numbness and you just do the next thing. But um, I, I write of it very vividly and, and detailed in the newest book that dropped in uh, June on Amazon called Now I See. Mm-hmm. That really is the book that walks you through everything we're talking about here from me being born with a disability to growing up with it to getting through, you know, tidbits of high school and college and then getting married and the crap show that that was and getting divorced and then meeting John who passed away and then nine chapters devoted to that whole experience and then the lessons that I've learned so far I mean I'm not here to say that I have all the answers or that I'm perfect or I've got it all together I mean I hope some days are better than others but Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm you know I'm doing the best I can like everybody else I'm not perfect but I can share what I've learned and I can share what I've gained and the truths and wisdom that have come from all this but um in that moment um I was in my living room um, and the cops were at the door and I remember asking them like, what is this about? He said, we really like to come in and talk to you. I said, what is this about? What is going on? He said, no, it was a female and it was a male cop from the Manchester police department. And they said, can we please come in? We need to speak to you. I was like, okay. And I had to close the door because I had to get, um, yeah, a little humor at that time. Mm, I was not very presentable at the time because uh, I was in the bed. <laughs> uh. And so I had to grab something to make myself presentable. Um, And so I, when I was presentable and I opened the door and they came in and I remember um, going to my knees with whatever was wrapped around me at the time, use your imagination if you didn't. (laughs) Um, And then when I sat on the couch and we finished talking, I went to go upstairs to change because I knew I was in for a long night. And they followed me upstairs with the female cop did. I was like, what are you doing? It's like, well, we need to make sure you're safe. I'm like, dude, I'm like, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I have two kids in my house. I'll be fine. I promise. And they wouldn't leave until I called someone. And I can't remember if I called my father first because I lived in Louisiana or my counselor first, or if I called the military first, because my husband was military. Mm -hmm. And the way it usually goes is the military notifies you. But because I found out first, I had to call the military. Uh, and so those are the three phone calls I made in whatever order I made them in. And by that point, um, my girlfriend, oh, I called my girlfriend first because they wanted someone to be with me mm-hmm. and she came over and then my minister came over. And then I think, uh, one of the people from my husband's unit eventually got over there too, to start that whole mess. And yeah. I think I went to bed at about two 30 that morning, just to get up at six o'clock in the morning to get my daughter ready for school. <laughs> oh, so and when nothing had happened. When you got you got your daughter up and sent her to school, did you tell her anything, no, or you just God, no. we're going to deal with that later? We're gonna. I had to get my head screwed on straight first, yeah. as much as possible, and wow. figure out how in the world I was going to break her heart and tell her. Oh God! Yeah. So, at what point did you tell her? I mean, was it that same day when she came home from school, or was it a couple of days later? No, I told her on Thursday, which was April sixth, and it was probably better it worked out that way because I finally figured out how and um by that point my parents had flown up from louisiana and they came and they met her at the bus stop and then um once everyone got in and said hi and greeted and you know good to see you you know whatever all this Mm -hmm. jazz when you do when you see your family um we decided i had an interesting conversation with my daughter that wednesday morning without her knowing what was going on she's always been kind of spiritual more inclined spiritually Mm-hmm. Now, I hadn't said a word. I was standing in front of the kitchen sink doing, you know, whatever we do in the morning for our kids, just kind of praying, you know, silently and thinking in my head, like, wow, did that really just happen less than 12 hours ago? Like, oh. what the hell? <laughs> Excuse my French, but what the hell? Because oh. that's really all you can think in that moment is what the hell? <laughs> um, something you didn't expect. Um, and realizing your world is literally shattered and turned on its ear and turned upside down and walk and everything else. She walked up to me and said, mommy, I want to tell you something. I'm like in a haze. I'm like, okay, like half asleep, half. I don't even know where my head was at at the time. I'm like, okay, baby. She said, I think Jesus is really happy when people come to see him. Oh, oh, you just gave me chills. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Now that was said to me at 630 in the morning or seven in the morning 
which was nine and a half to 10 hours of finding out that her father had gone to see Jesus. And she was completely unaware of anything when she said that to me. You could have knocked me over with a feather. Okay. And so I remember being in front of the kitchen sink thinking, okay, God, that's my way in. And so Thursday, when my parents got to the house, I said, hey, baby, why don't you tell that uh, Peppy and Chechik, because that's what they're called, um, that's mm-hmm. their grandparents' names. They picked them, not me. Um, <laughs> that's an interesting story in itself. I'm like, why couldn't you pick something normal, but whatever. Uh, you're going to confuse my poor children, but okay. <laughs> Um, I was like, why don't you tell Peppy and Checha the really cool conversation we had yesterday morning? It's, you know, awesome. So tell them because they always love hearing new things from their grandkids. Most grandparents do. And she told them and I said, well, baby, I need to talk to you about that conversation. And that's oh. what we Oh, how painful. Very. <laughs> oh. But um, just on a lighter note, I have to ask you this. What's the story behind Pepe and Cha-Cha? Oh, <laughs> okay. So I had, a, I didn't have the most longest or hardest journey in infertility. And I'm not taking that for a woman who really have to go through it, but I did have a little help getting pregnant. And my parents are up for Christmas 09 because um, we alternated years or whatever. And they had just gotten back from Italy for their 35th anniversary. Mm. And this is before COVID, of course. And we all traveled freely and no concern of nothing. And so they went to Italy for their 35th and they were in Tuscany. I think that trip they were in Tuscany and dad decided to start calling my mom, Francesca. Don't ask me why. And so <laughs> she announced to me while we were beginning our journey of trying to get pregnant, that if we ever have grandkids that I want to be Cheska and your father's decided he wants to be a peppy and fun grandfather. So we're going to be, he's going to be called peppy. I'm like, Okay, weirdos, whatever. <laughs> if you ever have grandchildren, you're going to confuse the crap of them. But why don't you wait until I'm pregnant before you decide these names? I'm not even pregnant yet. We're having this conversation. <laughs> is what I'm really thinking in 09. But and actually, ironically, I was actually pregnant during that conversation and didn't know it yet, which was kind of interesting. Oh, but, wow. <laughs> yeah, we didn't know yet because um, what we thought we had done to try and get pregnant didn't work by all accounts. Oh by the measurements and the metrics of what you do. And apparently it did work, but we didn't know because the thermometer was broken. So yeah, we kind of got surprised about New Year's Day or New Year's Eve Day. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Well, that's kind of another one of those um, God winks, I guess, just like, you know, that conversation happened at the time that you were expecting and didn't even know it. Yeah. And I was very annoyed and perturbed with them, like, you are crazy, but okay, fine. (laughs) The good news is um, they have probably got the most unique grandparents in the world. Nobody else, I'm sure, has that name. No, not that I've ever heard of. (laughs) No, me neither. When did you move to Louisiana then? How soon did you make that change? Because that's where you are now, right? Correct. Well, because of the way um, my daughter was finishing up her first grade year, um, just uh, my son was not in school yet because he was only three. Um the way Northern school schedules are compared compared to Southern school schedules are like totally opposite of each other. Mm. Like Northern, they won't get out until like June and don't go back to after Labor Day. Whereas down South, we're usually out by mid May or right before Memorial Day. And we go back under normal circumstances, pre COVID (laughs) (laughs) We, we go back before Labor Day weekend. So the South literally only had like a month left of school left. So was it worth breaking and killing myself trying to race down to get her settled in for maybe two weeks mm-hmm. of school, but then get her established in time for the next school year or just vote the remaining of the two months of Northern school schedule and just move after that, which is what we did. We moved on June 26th. So I moved cross country with two kids, uh, set everything up 90 days after my husband died. Oh, jeez! I didn't have a choice. It was either do that and get her set up for the next school year or wait it out another year. Oh my goodness. I mean, well, that's, you know, so traumatic anyhow, you know, the major life changes is, you know, a a move across country. That's a major life change and the loss of a spouse uh, again, major life change being becoming a single parent, major life change, all of that in the space of 90 days. 
and don't forget i'm still disabled so you know hey let's add that lovely extra yeah, let's, it's always with me you know let's make it more complicated and fun but you know yeah we'll put the little cherry on the top so yeah. how did you get through those 90 days on a lot of caffeine <laughs> I was, I would uh, get up in the morning, take care of my kids. And then I would get them, I would get Megan, uh, my daughter on the bus and settled and whatnot. And I'd get my son settled and then I would go out the door and do everything I had to do with the military stuff and get things in motion to move and everything else and finished up in New Hampshire. And I did that for 90 days. And then we flew out on June 26th. So my day basically for the first 90 days looked like uh, for anyone in your audience who may not understand military. And I'm not sure if this is ap- because John, my husband, was active duty, and they may do it for everyone or not. I just know from an active duty standpoint, you're assigned a person called a CAO, a casualty assistance officer, that literally does everything with you for the first three months to six months, whatever. And so I was with him every day for the 90 days, and we were doing everything in the world. So I would get up around 6, 6.30, take care of the kids, leave, get home between 4 and 5, get the kids settled in bed, and then I would start doing everything else I had to do. And generally speaking, I think in the first 90 days, I think I went to bed before 11, maybe three or five days in 90 days. Most nights it was like I was clocking 11, 12, 1, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, returning texts, phone calls, emails, and then do it again at six. So that's why I said I pretty much slipped on caffeine and autopilot. Oh my goodness. Well, now during that time, of course, you weren't writing, obviously. You were doing a lot of it got put on hold. What was interesting was I had just gone out of grad school in 2016, the summer before, and I traded all the, um, cause when I started grad school, which probably was not a good idea. Cause my daughter was eight months old. Why I thought that was a good idea. I don't know. <laughs> I was in grad school for five years. And by the time it was all said and done, we'd had our son. And so when I got out of grad school, they were, um, that was 2016. So Megan was going on six and Jesse was going on two no three yeah um and so um I traded all of nap time and night time and Saturdays for grad school work for writing time because mm-hmm. I had percolated like all these crazy ideas and amazing insane amount of ideas in grad school because I was writing during grad school but I was writing for professors I wasn't writing my stuff I was writing for them <laughs> all the mm-hmm. time because in my vision, when I'm in school, that's all I do. I don't have time for anything else because I'm good at it, but it takes me a really long time to be good at it. Mm-hmm. It takes a lot of extra work that most people wouldn't even dream of. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not like normal, like, ah, eh, I can cram for that final or I'll write that paper. No, 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 no. It doesn't work that way in my world. So yeah. let me, let me just ask real quickly. What did you get your master's in? Uh, political science and American government with a grad certificate in ancient classical history. No, I cannot do one thing. My undergraduate was a BA in sociology with a double minor in English and history. Mm -hmm. Okay. Must've been a fascinating experience just with the American history. Yeah. And so when I got out of grad school, I decided to start, I took a month off. I said, I don't want to hear the word book. I don't want to look at a book. Don't talk to me. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't want to do nothing but relax and just basically decompress for yes. five years of insane workload like I'm not doing nothing unless it's my kids or my household go away mm-hmm. go away so after that month of in self-imposed sabbatical from any actual worthy work <laughs> <laughs> that had any meaning whatsoever um I decided to organize all my ideas and I thought okay well I don't have grad school work anymore thank god I'll use nap time and nighttime to start writing. And so I started with my motherhood series and I had written book one, two and part started book three when everything changed in April, 2017. Mm-hmm. And then, so, yeah, I had to kind of step away from it for a little bit to get things, you know, kind of put our world back together <laughs> Yeah, going on with that. So I didn't really have a lot of time for anything else. And then we got it settled in Louisiana and then somewhere between 2017 and 18, I slowly started pick it, uh, picking at writing again. And then at 2019, I had come across an organization that literally teaches you how to self-publish. And so that's when I started cranking out books. So in that period of time then, so that's, we're talking like uh, five years. For grad school. Well, yeah, five years for grad school, but after your husband passed away, when you first started writing like your book on motherhood and to Ooh, now I were already written in New Hampshire, I just published what I started with. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Other projects. Cause I'd already written two of them in New Hampshire and started, I was on process of book three when everything went to crap. 
And those, the first two then were on motherhood. Yeah, they all three were. So I figured, well, instead of starting from scratch, why don't I start with what I've already got material done? So that's why I published that one first. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you've published quite a few books. How many all totaled? Eight. I'm looking to get four more out the rest of this year, if I can get it going. And then I've got a whole lineup for next year. And you should see my binder. I could theoretically have a five, six year plan through 2026, 2027. That to me is just amazing. People who are that prolific and able to write like that just blows me away. I mean, it took me two and a half years to write my first book and probably five years to write the second one. Yeah, but you have to realize academic writing is very different from creative writing. It's a totally different process for one thing. Yeah, my mind, the first one wasn't really academic. It was a little bit, well, it's kind of like a self-help. And the yeah. second one is a memoir, kind of. It's about my okay. experience going into, you know, to martial arts as, you know, 47-year-old middle-aged princess. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it's really funny. It's, there's a lot of really funny stories in the book. But I'm also working on my family's history. And wow. I've been working on that for several years. And, you know, it's, it's like the more I look into it and the more I, I write, the bigger this thing is becoming. That's usually the way it goes. <laughs> yeah. So any advice for someone like me? <laughs> um, in what sense? I'm managing the project or just getting it done? Managing the project. Um, a lot of times I will create something and there's two different schools of thought and writing, especially more on the fiction side, but I'm nonfiction. So it doesn't really affect mm-hmm. me as much as being someone who's not a planned writer and you just go with where your characters take you or where the project takes you. I, however, am on the plan sign. Like before I sit down and writing a project, I always have a plan or an outline. That is not to say that if what's in the project, it needs to change that I'm opposed to changing it. But for me mentally, I have to at least have a jumping off spot and know where I'm headed. Mm -hmm. I have to have some semblance of, okay, this is what I'm following now. If I change it five times in the process, I don't give a crap. At least I've started it. It doesn't matter. I've got the juices flowing. The trick to writing is um, making sure you're finding the time to do it. Mm -hmm. because it's great when inspiration comes but that doesn't always come so if you wait for inspiration yeah you'll never get it done (laughs) Uh, anyway (laughs) so I I I believe very much it's just like anything whatever you dedicate yourself to and discipline about you'll get it done I mean it's like they say how do you eat an elephant you eat it one bite at a time so let's say you have a manuscript that's I don't know you want it to be 100 pages or you want it I do it by chapter so let's say I have a 40 chapter manuscript or whatever then I'll know that if I can get two chapters done today or whatever, or one at one for five days, then I'll have it done in like eight weeks. Wow. Wow. And that's what I do. I get my kids and see my life's changed because both my kids are in school now. So I have the freedom of eight to three to write or podcast. Or mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I get them ready. And then by nine or nine 30, you know, if I stay on task, I'm on my computer writing, banging out a chapter or two, depending on what I'm writing. Mm-hmm. How did your um, children adapt to the move? Well, they had never lived in Louisiana before. I had. I lived in Louisiana for almost 20 years before I moved to New Hampshire. So I was established here, which okay. probably helped them get established, you know, because we just plugged in right back into my old everything and their mm-hmm. grandparents are here, but they did pretty good, you know. So. Kids, kids are pretty resilient. And they had been to Louisiana before. It's just they'd never lived here. So it wasn't like it was totally no tune. Like we just picked some random spot on the map and say, hey, we're going to go there. No. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and so, and now let's go back to your writing because um, uh, again, you do have quite a variety of topics that you, that you write about. And so I'm going to list them if you don't mind. Okay. Um, so you, ha- you have your, your personal memoir, which is the newest book. And that's the one now I see, by the way, love the title. Thank you. Love the title. Well, it was a play on the fact that actually now I see <laughs> literally. <laughs> and then, but also now I see all these things of wisdom and truth that I've learned along the way that I've discovered. So it was mm-hmm. dual purpose. Yeah. I love that little double entendre. And you're, you wrote one on America's government. Yes. We, the people are, I love that title too. Thank you. And, you know, kids and parenting faith and spirituality. And of course, we already talked about motherhood and you have um, a book on poetry. That was my first one I ever did back in 2011 that I picked up for years because like I said, I was in high school and college, so I didn't have a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And then I finally found a way to publish that. And I may go back to that at some point and do other ones in that vein of thought. But my focus right now is 
the series that you mentioned of um, motherhood and religion Mm -hmm. and politics in the sense of not who's right or who's wrong. I'm not going to get into that, but it's more of just understanding what America's supposed to be. And I I often say when people ask me about that one, if you want to know how to play the game, you got to know the rules. You don't know the rules. You can't play the game rule. You wouldn't walk on a football field or a baseball diamond, not knowing how to play the game. And I don't really care if you agree with the rules or not, you got to understand them to play it. So we need to know what this is, what's supposed to be. And then you can do what you want with it. Anyway, that's another whole ball game, literally. Um, <laughs> you, play on words, you, actually. you really do like those play on words, don't you? Yeah, I do. I like to be clever and I like to be a little bit of a smart aleck for better yeah. or for worse circumstance. Sometimes I get in trouble, but that's okay. I'm a big girl. Well, uh, well, well-behaved women never make history. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Amen to that. I know that's right. Yeah. So who wants to be boring? Um, you also have some more works that you're working on living the beach life and light um, and love. Uh, living the beach life is out. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know exactly what you're speaking of in the last one, because what it references, there was a magazine back in 2000. Oh God. I think I was still in grad school. So 2015, I had two articles published in oh, gotcha. life and light or light and life. It wasn't mm-hmm. love. So I, that's the only thing I can think of on that one. I do basically these things we're talking about are all I'll be building out. And so this year is very much the year of sequels starting now until end of 22. And so I built, I will build out those five series, um, which is actually what I'm hoping to get out in the next few months is book two and three of motherhood, and then move on to the sequels of all the other series. And then eventually once my plate gets a little clearer, I'm going to take the religious series of faith series and build it out into another one that takes exactly the same content, but hopefully gear it more towards teens and uh, university students. Yeah. Nice. Nice. What's your favorite uh, topic to write about? I actually love also, which sounds really like, okay, of course you do. You're the writer, but I mean, people talk about they're all your baby. I mean, not my baby babies, Mm -hmm. my children, but like my work babies, they're all my babies. So how can you not love them? But I think the one that is the most, I don't want to say advantageous or beneficial because that seems self-serving, but I mean, advantageous from a work standpoint of what a message and reaching people and sharing what I think I've learned is probably the now I see one because it literally lays out Mm -hmm. what I've been through and what I've learned from it that hopefully will maybe inspire or empower someone else on their own journey. You know, Mm -hmm. passions and my interests and you know, I like the stuff, so I'm going to write about it, but And not that that's not important. I'm not saying that. And I think I can offer some things in each of those categories. But as far as what I really feel like my core message is supposed to be to the world, it would be the now I see one. And that's going to be a series as well. Oh, yeah, that I'm going to build that one out as well. They're all series. So everyone's seen the first in all these series. Oh, awesome. Okay, so now that's a, a good segue to how can people find all these works and how can they, you know, find you? Can they follow you? Do you have some social media sites? Anything? Just go ahead and blast it. Let um, the listeners know where they can find you and see some of your work. All of my books are on Amazon right now. I eventually hope to branch out into other things and audio and all that, but it's all on Amazon. I have a website called myheartfeltmeditations.com. You can go to all of my books are on there. All of my social media links are on there, but I am on Facebook. I am on um, Instagram. I'm not the best at social media, but I am out there. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. It's, I have a love hate relationship with it myself. So Um, are, is there any advice, any pearls of wisdom you can leave the listeners with? I mean, with everything that you have gone through um, and I'm not saying that, oh, you're so resilient. I know it was a lot of work to, to get through some of these difficulties, the life's trials and tribulations for anybody else who might be struggling right now or know somebody that's struggling. Do you have any advice that you could share with them right now? Yeah. I mean, I am resilient. You're right, but it is not always easy. It's not a cakewalk. Um, Mm -hmm. This could dive into other subjects. It could be an episode within itself for anybody who wanted to know, but the process that I've used to get through not one, but all three of these, a lot of it I learned early in life. And then I was able to use it again when I had to, because if you choose to be an overcomer in life, no matter what the tribulation, mine are going to be different from yours and yours, mine, and from someone else's. 
But the fact of the matter is, and overcoming is overcoming is overcoming, no matter what you're overcoming. It's still, it's like a muscle memory of doing the same thing again. Mm-hmm. You still have to do it the same way, no matter whatever that mountain you're trying to climb. So I feel like these things are universally applicable to anyone, because if you want to overcome, it's still what you have to do, no matter what you're trying to get through. Obviously, first and foremost is my faith, hands down. Mm-hmm. And then second of all, I believe that life is a choice. Um, you can either be defined by your circumstances or you can define them for yourself. Mm-hmm. And then second of all, mindset is key in allowing yourself to be able to achieve the choices you set out to want to do. And then I feel like self-care is equally as important and then having resources. So those are kind of been my systematic approach to doing all this stuff and Mm -hmm. taking on these tribulations and trials of disability and, you know, divorce and and death of my husband. But as far as what I would say to anyone of what they want out of life, I would say life is a choice. You get to define it or it can define you. So define it for yourself. Realize we get one shot at this or travel it well, Mm -hmm. choose well and be willing to thrive. Incredible words of wisdom. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything else that you would like to say or like to share with us before we sign off? No, just it's a journey and enjoy it and live it well. You get one. Okay. I like that. So thrive. All right. Well, thank you, Michaela. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you for sharing your story, your beautiful voice and your wonderful advice with us. Well, thank you for having me. I hope it helps someone to be able to go forward on their own journey. I'm sure it will. There was a lot of really good stuff in this. So everybody, thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate you as well. And remember, no matter what you're going through, just uh, thrive. The choice is yours. And I know it's tough sometimes. Check out uh, Michaela's books and, you know, maybe they will help you get through the rough times. And that is the way of the Femininja. And that's a wrap on another episode of The Femininja Project. Thank you so much for listening. And remember, be safe, be strong. And until next time, bye now.